before we get started, thank you so much for all the talks. It was really fantastic. We have seen, we talked about how it is to be somebody who is in the team, taking on a massive project of many products, and then how that can cause burnout. So it's a nice link. We have quite a lot of questions, actually. So if you want to add questions, please do so. If you want to ask in the audience, just put your hands up and say I have a question. Otherwise, I'm just going to go with it. We're going to start here. Damola, so one question which is directly to you straight away. Please feel free for the rest of your answer as well. When it comes to naming, how do you work across design and engineering to assure alignment and naming that makes sense to both disciplines? I'll, I'll talk from like a designer standpoint. So there is this, I can't quite remember the person, but it's this designer on Twitter, on design Twitter, that asked, that just posted random components of like, what is this thing called? I'm thinking call it like 15 different names. There was one component that had like, <laughs> God knows how many names, right? But I found that what works is, most things always have like a universally acceptable name, right? But you want to have like, I would call sort of aliases for them, sort of like, if it's not called this, what else could it be called, right? And when you do stuff like random polls, ask your team members, like, what would you call this thing? You can find maybe 50% of your, your team members call it something, but maybe 25% call it something else, right? So you go with the, like, universally acceptable name, but you always have, like, aliases, so that when I search for this stuff, it still pops up somewhere. And that's sort of uh, what I would do if I was a design systems person. I'm not, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. Looking at Amy straight away, I mean, in your experience, like, what's a good way of looking at naming? Because I know, I know teams that spend a lot of time on naming, and I feel that like sometimes it's an escape from what they actually should be focusing on. I think naming is really important, but I do think that there are cases where you'll never get a hundred percent consensus. So my advice is just get as close as you can to that go with the majority and then use tools to reinforce your naming convention. So yeah, if you have like a design system documentation website, build aliases into the search so people can search using the name that they know for the thing and then can be taken to the thing that you, as you've called it, keep an eye on what people are typing into that search so that you can adjust the name if you need to. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is hard to get consensus. I think we did a an exercise when I was working at GDS where we asked people to name a design pattern. And in five minutes, we generated 186 different names with duplicates removed for the pattern. So it is, yeah, it's not, there's not consensus, but I think just get as close as you can to that and then try to reinforce your naming conventions and educate people on those. Excellent, thank you. And Tony, you guys are in the middle of it all. How are you dealing with this? Completely agree with the majority. I don't think you'll ever find a component consensus. It's it's one of those things. Everyone, it's it's a little bit like design, really. Everything is, you know, everyone's got their own view of it. It's been like fashion, so everyone will give it a different spin. So, yeah, find the commonalities and stick with it. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Continuing on your talk about onboarding, what did you find to be the biggest challenge on onboarding? This is, again, for all of you. Like, what is the biggest challenge on onboarding the rest of the team? I think the biggest challenge about onboarding is not the one on the design systems side. It's like <clears throat> onboarding on a team generally is difficult. It's very, very hard. And then layering it on something like something that is fairly unfamiliar can also be a bit daunting, right? Um, but I find that the most challenging thing was figuring out where stuff was, right? Um, yeah. But it was actually very easy to find it, but I just didn't know where to look in the first place, right? But there was this designer I spoke with, and she was like, yeah, we should have a call, and figured out everything for me in like 15 minutes. So I was like, yeah, so this is where this stuff is. Once you get there, search for it, and you'd find it there. And it was that simple, right? But also finding stuff that I, like, knowledge of, or like, oh, this should be named this, or this was what I thought it was, but not being able to find that stuff was a bit tricky for me. Another thing was also like making sure I was important. Like my team is pretty big and mm -hmm. there's like a million, now, maybe not a million now one, but quite a number of um, libraries. Making sure I was importing the right library into my system. I made this funny mistake of using the web library while I was work working on mobile. Some things worked, but I was like, yeah, this should not be right. So 
important to write library also was a bit difficult finding the right thing to import. Great, thank you. Amy, you have any hot tips on onboarding success? I think try to make it part of your user research. So really take the time to understand your company's kind of culture and the wider ecosystem the design system is going to sit in. So if you're testing the design system with users, whether that's like the code or the documentation or whatever, you know, start by asking like, okay, where would you look for this today before you've got the system or if you have a design system like say where would you go to find this thing if you have this task where would you start and pay attention to what they're saying and then infiltrate the you know the, the existing tools and processes that they're engaging with rather than trying to sort of fight against it I think if you create something in isolation and just expect people to find it or go to it it's not going to work so you have to really make it bespoke to your company's context observe how people are actually using it rather yeah. than dictating what they should be doing. Exactly. Yeah. Tony, you guys are onboarding new people all the time, I'm assuming. I know for a fact there's a big challenge and you are in the middle of it at the moment. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of the designer experience as well when you actually join a new product team. And I agree, it's, it's being visible. Uh, we have something called a playbook, uh, which we're looking to introduce we may introduce into our design system as well but i think it's just been very clear around where you can go to find things if we have how-to videos as well if we had the luxury to create rich media videos all of the the documentation that goes behind onboarding token studio how to attach it to your file where do you go for new libraries all of that kind of good stuff yeah it's it's all about just making the invisible visible excellent thank you uh, speaking of what's included in the design system, Tony, you mentioned that you enable marketing team with a design system. Is this solely about maintaining brand consistency or are they actually using parts of the system for, for their work as well? Good question. It's the latter. So I think they're, I do know to be fair, they're pretty much, it's more around brand consistency first, but I think the future vision is for them to self-serve with assets tone of voice, um, all of the kind of great stuff that lives in design system. And we're trying to parallel with, with our brand team as well to introduce our brand guidelines alongside our design system under one roof as well, just to ensure that, again, clarity, visibility is, is as visible as we can get it. Okay, excellent. Amy, on the design system that you have worked on, have, have marketing ever been involved or any Un, I'm not going to say unexpected because marketing can be a very expected team to use it, but are there sort of teams that we might not immediately think of as when we create a design system that's for using it? Honestly, no. Mainly when I've worked with clients that I've worked with, there has tended to be this quite hard separation between marketing and the design system. In the same way, I think there's often a separation between content design and marketing like copywriting that often seems to be this kind of arbitrary division between those different things even though there is definitely an overlapping kind of concern and skill set um i don't think it should be that way but in my experience it often is that way i was just about to ask that do you think that there should be more collaboration between Probably, them yeah. yeah definitely i mean it all forms part of the user experience and i think if you're interested in giving kind of coherent joined up user experiences then you should be thinking about that kind of all the way through the funnel but I just think organizations often aren't set up in that way. And as a design system team, how much do you want to, how much time do you want to spend reorganizing your company versus just working within those constraints? Fair enough. The Mola, Spotify, have you got any other teams involved or, or how, what does it look like? I can't really speak for Spotify, but I can speak for the way I look at things, right? I got into design for the sake that people experience things a particular way, right? And design, like product design or design or user interface design generally is about every single touch point of your product, right? From the marketing in some sense, to the product in itself, to the feeling the, like your users have after using your product, right? Like that's what design is, right? So companies are structured in specific ways, but it's also important to like cater for the end user, which is like your user, like the people that actually use this thing every single day, right? And that's what really matters at the end of the day. We're working for them. Okay, brilliant. So talking about end users and how they're using it, let's move into measuring. We did have a couple of conversations about that. Amy, you mentioned the issues of quantitative data. Should we bother? What's the, <laughs> what's the hot tip? I think we should bother as long as our expectations about what 
quantitative data, what's achievable with quantitative data are realistic and managed. So I think it can be helpful to try and gather some quantitative data if you're looking at it from the perspective of like, we can get a picture of trends over time, but I think trying to get accurate quantitative data is there's only so much time that you want to spend. I think it's like the naming thing. It's kind of like get as close as you can and just go with it because you, you'll drive yourself crazy if you're trying to pinpoint that accurately. So the design system metrics, quantitative metrics, unless they're metadata about the system, which you can collect accurately. If you want to measure things like impact on product design time, it's so complex and it's affected by so many other things that I just... I'd get a sense of it and then I'd measure that sense of it over time, but I wouldn't bother trying to be scientific about it. It's fair enough. It's quite difficult to be scientific about it. I think in my experience as well, I often, well, often, I have found sometimes that you realize a bit later on what, what you wished you had measured before you started and you're like, ah, oh, damn it, we should have done that when we started. So yeah. You make it up. That's when you go back. <laughs> you just lie. That's <laughs> what I do. Hot tip, you all heard it from Amy. It wasn't me, it was her. What what the rest of, what um for Tony and Mala, what have you uh, how would you measure? Um I would say sentiment is important. So certain things can be measured by oh, we use design time by seven type percent. Like that's a lie. Right. But you can say this session said, Oh, I would design this component before by myself and now I didn't have to do that. And that's simple, like this is somebody speaking as opposed to like just looking at the data like yeah we lied about we didn't design time but sometimes so you can really fancy that but what you can do in depth what people are saying i sort of come from the big that's i'm presented that should work yeah still doesn't give us those numbers that amy mentioned the stakeholders want and i agree with that it's very tough so tony you you selling the design system as an initiative to the business and getting their buy-in and now in it. What what are they expecting to see and how are you showing numbers, if any? It's, yeah, I agree. I, I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum. My, my exec team want to see numbers. It's a financial business. I think it very much depends on your environment and the company and how it's set up. And, if, you know, being able to quantify, I, I think you need, for me, you need to look broader than just design. I think you need to dip into the product teams, again, looking at their velocity compared to that, without getting too deep into it, but looking at day rates aligned with velocity sprint points per sprint. Again, it does take a lot of product knowledge and understanding how, how squads work and operate. I think that's, that's the key to unlocking the right, the right angle of approach when talking to executives for funding and continued funding is that, which I, I loved your slide around. I know it's boring, just like we've got funding. How do we keep that funding? But I think it's, it's, it's a necessary evil to, to secure the, ultimately the future of your design system and to keep the, the lights on. You actually showed us the numbers of the interesting setup that you guys had before the design system. Have you looked at those numbers afterwards and see if they changed in any way or is that some kind of indicator for you guys? I think those are our benchmark. Those are our flags in the sand. And I think they're, they're the numbers that we want to try and reduce. Again, as we have over a hundred different component libraries in Figma when we only have 15 products, still blows my mind today. And I think, you know, that is the going rogue approach we may have gone rogue a little bit, just like the engineers. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's a few of those things that are in, in the year's time when we finish this year of implementation, I want to look back on, on those numbers and, and tell the story of improvement. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very much our, our indicators at the moment. Fair enough. It's early on as well. Um, speaking of stakeholders and trying to convince them, how do you convince your stakeholders, managers with no design background that you need more designers in your design team of two and that they need to work on design systems? That's a tough question. Yeah, you go first, Tony. You're... <laughs> uh, um, that is a good, uh, yeah, that is a good question. I think my, my advice would be to, Again, take a benchmark of where you're at and again, understand your stakeholder. If they've got no design experience, 
again, you can feel like you're talking to a grandparent, right? You're trying to explain something super technical, eyes glaze over when, when you know, when's the standards coming? But I think it's, it's about the approach and understanding what their drivers are and their, if they've got a key state, if it's your PM or your PO, understanding from their point of view, like a cool design system can reduce the amount of time that your engineers spend building uh, a new page or a new feature or you know, tapping into doesn't have to ne necessarily be design or design related because you know, I'm a big advocate of you, you can talk design to people that aren't interested until you're blue in the face, but you, you gather nothing. Um, but it's always interesting that the designers are expected to talk at business level and talk the business, but it's never the other way around. I've always found that quite fascinating. But um, but yeah, find find your angle with them, find what, what drives them, find what their needs are and their requirements are and tailor, tailor your request around that for resource for a design system. And show them i think that's that's probably yeah show them how it's working demonstrate it then talk in the theory show in the practice fair enough amy in your experience as a consultant to someone that comes into an organization i guess you often meet people who don't have that design experience how do you talk to them to get them to understand very rudely um, <laughs> no i mean i well the question i think mentioned um how do you convince your stakeholders to hire more designers and get them to work on a design system when you're a when you're a, when they're they're two designers so I, I suppose i challenge that with like well why do you do you really need people to be proactively working on a design system with a team that small like even if you double the size of your design team you're gonna have four people so you may at that stage not need to invest that time and effort into a design system like i think it's important to think about debt but a lot of the problems that a design system might solve at a larger scale can potentially be solved with just more, you know, closer collaboration when we're talking about that kind of scale. Um, when I am talking to stakeholders who don't understand the importance of design systems, maybe it's slightly larger scales. I think, yeah, like you said, it's a lot of it's about really understanding what's driving them. It's not providing a kind of one size fits all sales pitch it's figuring out like well what do you care about and how will a design system help you with those goals yeah yeah fair enough yeah i think what you said as well is interesting it's like sometimes we think <clears throat> sometimes some organization think that an engineer no more engineers is the solution and sometimes it'd be more designers is the solution but actually what is the setup what is it that we're trying to do and and are, are we having enough cross communication with other people and maybe that isn't the answer it's not more design it's, it's actually something else so yeah interesting we're we going to slightly shift here i'm going to come back to you as well then don't worry about we're we going to slightly shift topic here amy i have two questions which is about burnout uh, uh, directly here you mentioned that you're coming to us from the depths of your own burnout um what's your advice for someone who is burnout already and we actually have a very similar question with burnout being a huge and persistent challenge, how do you refresh yourself and recharge your creative batteries and mental health? What's your tips? Go to the doctor. Um, <laughs> I'm actually sort of not really joking. Um, I don't. I think when you are burnt out, it's a really, really complex thing, and it can like I was listening to a podcast the other day when one of the co-hosts was a presenter, and she was saying time and time again she sees people come into her office who have recently been signed off work for like two weeks because they're burnt out and they're like well I thought I'd come and see you but I'll be back in two weeks and you know maybe you can help me in the meantime and every single time it gets to the two weeks and they're like I'm not ready to go back and like it it can take a really really long time to recover from burnout we don't all have the luxury of taking loads of time off um, and at some point I think that can stop helping as well so I think it's a balance of as I kind of said in the talk figuring out what helps you to have a sense of accomplishment. And I talked about that in the context of design systems work, but I think in more general terms, like that might be something completely unrelated to your job. It might be your hobbies or your, you know, endeavors outside of work. Um, figure out how you can start to feel a sense of achievement again. Like I think completely grinding to a halt isn't great. However, breaks are important. Like take time off, take time to reflect about how you've ended up here and what you can do to get yourself out of it. 
we also have here, which I don't think is a question, but it's kind of more sounds like an expression of burnout. I am going to try to do my best to read this out. Why, God, why, please, why, parenthesis, I'm burnt out. Um, going to cover that, so we cover that one. I've also got here someone who's just making a statement. A design system is not a product. I don't know who that is, but I am looking at someone who I'm suspecting might have said that. I think we, many people agree with this. You mentioned this as well. On that note, for those people who think, as we talk about design systems to organization, and we kind of tell them that it is something that they need to think about, if it's not a product, you mentioned service, Amy. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on that? I like to think of them as services because I think it kind of puts the emphasis on the things that often get under focused on with design systems. So support, contribution, process, onboarding, like all that kind of stuff that we often neglect. Talking about it as a service, I think sets an expectation that it is an ongoing thing and that there is there are processes and, and kind of exchanges and collaborations and things that need to happen around it. Um, that said, I honestly, like I've made the argument, like don't call it a product before. I actually don't really care what we call it. I think the, the important point is like, why are we saying that? What is the actual ask? So you mentioned like treat it like a product because it needs continuous funding, because it needs a team, it needs to be properly resourced. And I agree with all of that. So I don't think it actually matters whether we say it's a product or a service or whatever you want to call it, as long as you're being explicit about what you're actually asking for when you're saying Absolutely. that. Absolutely, I 100% agree. I was that. gonna say, yeah, just uh, I completely agree around with the service point as well. Um, thinking about how we consume services these days, it's design systems fall into that that way of consumption. It's a continuous thing. It's it's forever to be maintained, it'll continually grow. And I think, yeah, where, where my, my standpoint comes from is ensuring that there is a bedrock there to ensure that that can continue. Uh, that's yeah that i think that's where my my kind of product thinking comes from but yeah i completely agree on, on the service it is it's a continuous thing yeah i think i think it's i'm asking you because i actually I, i've said both in my past and i agree i think it's the, for me what's important is that whoever is going to take that on realizing that it's going to have an impact on what they're doing in the daily work and they're taking on something else that they have to commit to and that needs nurture and care. And if they don't do that, it's not going to be successful. Whether you call it a product or whether you call it a service, as you're pointing out, Amy, as long as you know what it is and why you're saying it. Damala, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, service product really doesn't matter. I think what matters is understanding what you're working on, what you're doing, and understanding the impact of your work on people that are going to use your, the, the stuff you're working on could be a service or a product. Um, something that's also unique is that different companies can be very unique. And it's calling it a product because a company understands that when we work on a product, we will continuously maintain that product. Might resonate with a particular kind of company. Calling it a service, I run it with somebody else. So like, the core idea is understand who you're seeking to, understand what matters to them, and communicate in such a way that you can convince them, not manipulate them, but convince them to do what you want to. I have got a few questions left, quite a lot of questions left. Unfortunately, we haven't got much time left. So I'm just going to quickly rush through some of these. And I'm doing this because we are going to be networking. So for those of you who have put questions in that you didn't get a response to, please feel free to come to us during the networking and ask directly. And maybe we can get some of this. One of the questions is what design animal are you? We might leave that one for right now. What's the best way to showcase a design system as a case study? Subject matters experts, how long do you feel uh, you need to work to product to hit a moment when you can truly understand it? It's all very interesting questions. Someone just starting a design system, what are the basic and how should you get started? These are perfect questions to bring up in the pub. Uh, is there an argument that the system life cycle requires different skill sets? Maybe you can quit at the beginning and let other people kill continuing. That's an interesting point to ponder on, also over a drink. You talked about embracing chaos, Damola. When would be the best time to consolidate? Great thing to go up straight to Damola and ask him afterward. Someone here mentioned as well, if it's not written down, it's not done. Like it, that's just a statement, fantastic. And Tony, with a big initiative like this, obviously there need to be work with engineers on how was the support and collaboration. Another great thing to speak directly to Tony about in a pub near you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with, with that, unfortunately, we have to wrap up the Q&A session. Um, I want to thank all the speakers so much. Thank you so much, it's been fantastic.